36 people were on what many say was a life-changing trip, but none of them ever left a university laboratory. They volunteered to take the psychedelic ingredient that puts the so-called magic in certain kinds of mushrooms. And now there's a surprising follow-up. CNN's Carol Costello joins us live with the results. Carol, what's happening now? Well, John, maybe the hippies of the 60s weren't just on something. Maybe they were on to something. Scientists at Johns Hopkins now say magic mushrooms really can expand your mind, producing a kind of religious experience. Fourteen months ago, they gave dozens of volunteers magic mushrooms. And today, those volunteers are still feeling the effects. <laughs> The whole Johns Hopkins study seems just so hippie dippy 60s. It brings to mind Timothy Leary, the man who first widely touted the alleged magic in this tiny mushroom. Five years ago, uh, by accident in Mexico, uh, I took uh, Mexican mushrooms. Leary, a Harvard researcher, claimed his mushroom-induced psychotic trip was so spiritual... It led him and a generation to turn on, tune in, and drop out. Yeah, until the federal government stepped in and made hallucinogenic drugs illegal. Fast forward to 2006 and this research room at Johns Hopkins. 36 volunteers took part in an initial study on whether psilocybin, the active ingredient in magic mushrooms, really does have a lasting spiritual effect on people. Dee Dee Osborne, a business consultant, volunteered to find out. It's a very a beautiful feeling. I've not felt anything like that before. Osborne, lying on this couch, received one dose over an eight-hour period. She saw a kaleidoscope of colors. Then... There was a tearing open of my heart. And then uh, the, the feeling that uh, we were all one. The effects of that single session are still with her 14 months later and with other volunteers. The study says at two months, the volunteers rated the experience as having spiritual significance and sustained positive changes in behavior. Most people had experiences that really looked quite indistinguishable from classically occurring mystical type experiences. The study is nothing like those done in the 60s. They're far more controlled. The goal is to explore whether this drug could prove therapeutic to those terminally ill. Volunteers who are under psychological distress secondary to a cancer diagnosis. And the thought here is that an experience of this type uh, primary mystical experience might well alter the course uh, and the per or the perception that the individual has of their disease process and quality of life. As for those volunteers who took that long, strange trip on Johns Hopkins' couch, the study says most have no regrets and feel their world is a better place because of it. In the 60s, some people used mushrooms for the hallucinogenic effects. Well, now those same so-called magic mushrooms are being used to ease the pain and anxiety of cancer patients. In Health Watch today, KCAL 9's Stephanie Abrams takes a closer look at mushroom medicine. And she always had that smile, a beautiful smile of hers. Norbert Litzinger looks lovingly at pictures of his late wife, Pamela Sakuda. They met when he was just 15 years old. Kodinsky. That was a favorite of Pam's and mine. He revisits their times together at the Los Angeles County Museum of Art, remembering her joy for life and when her stage 4 cancer diagnosis took it away. She had been on uh, conventional antidepressants, which were absolutely useless. And when you strip a person of hope, there's only a shell left. That's when she volunteered to be part of a study, researching the effects of psychedelic drugs on terminally ill patients. In the 60s, the band named the Magic Mushrooms sang about what they called tripping. A far cry from what happened in lab rooms at the Los Angeles Biomedical Research Institute. This is where Dr. Charles Grobe got government approval to break a more than 40-year hiatus studying the active ingredient in those mushrooms called psilocybin. We essentially corroborated many of the findings of the old researchers from the 1960s that this treatment when optimally controlled can facilitate a, a, a reduction in anxiety, improvement of mood, and overall improvement of quality of life. He gave 12 terminally ill cancer patients just one dose of the drug, a six-hour mind-bending experience that Dr. Grove says allowed them to release their anxiety about dying. Norbert was allowed to walk in three hours into Pam's treatment. For the first time, she had this incredible beaming light. 
that was just coming from her. And she was happy. I hadn't seen Pammy happy like that since really the diagnosis. And for the first time, it looked like the entire weight of the world had been lifted from her shoulders. There was a tremendous feeling of relief and of, of very, uh, of happiness and of, of hope. Before she passed, Pamela shared her transformation with a Hefter Research Institute, which promotes research of psychedelics. I don't think the drug is, is the cause of these things. I think it's a catalyst that allows you to release your own thoughts and feelings from someplace that you've, you've found them very tightly. Dr. Grove says patients like Pam didn't have what's commonly known as a trip. With his low controlled dose, they didn't hallucinate, seeing the world around them change. Instead, they had visions with their eyes closed, changing their perception of their own lives. Individuals who have a, an optimal, ideal experience will, will report they come out of it feeling much less anxiety about the inevitability of their passing on. At this point, I'm willing to try anything. Lynn Eklund is dying from ocular melanoma that spread to her liver and her lungs. It's pretty high anxiety sometimes if I let it get to me. She keeps pushing on with everyday duties in her Silver Lake home, but like Dr. Grove's patients, she's very afraid of what's next. I think it would help my mental state at this time if I did have something like that, you know, to help me, re I think it would help me relax. A gift to her and her partner who suffered watching her suffer. She's hoping research on psilocybin will continue so that in the future people like her might be able to smile again, like Pam did up until her very last moments captured in this picture. She died on our living room sofa in my arms exactly the way we had intended it with our cat Sally. In terms of uh, the hallucinogens per se, my interest rests primarily in their potential application as a, um, as, as a medical psychiatric treatment and I believe that they're particularly valuable for patient populations that do not respond well to conventional treatments. Diagnosed with terminal lung cancer, one would be hard pressed to accuse Pam Sakuda of only wanting to get high. The people who are waging the war on drugs have every interest in continuing to do so because especially um, medicines like hallucinogens and I think we all agree in these discussions that what they do is they allow you to change your perspective and to think outside of the box that you're closed into. And that's the last thing that this, this power structure wants, is for you to think outside of the box. In fact, they'd rather make your box smaller. They're the drugs once associated with hippies in the 1960s. LSD, hallucinogenic mushrooms, once feared as a one-way ticket to insanity, now being discussed as real medicine to treat real problems. Well, I am a firm believer. I've seen it work in many people. Rick Doblin imagines a day when patients will be able to go to their doctor's offices for their doses of LSD or ecstasy pills. I think eventually there will be psychedelic clinics regulated by FDA with people who are specially trained to administer the psychedelics and people will come to them for medical purposes or for rites of passage in their life or personal growth. Doblin comes with credentials. He's got a PhD from Harvard in public policy and has spent years studying psychedelics. Proving that there is a convention for practically everything, researchers from around the world have come to San Jose, California to talk about psychedelic drugs. Here at the Holiday Inn, they are sharing stories about those drugs and their hope that one day they will become a regular part of medicine. Here at the conference, we found Sarah Huntley, who says she was abused emotionally and physically as a child. It made me feel worthless most of the time, and that um, I was a burden to that member of my family, and that I wasn't really worth that burden. She says the abuse stripped her of self-confidence. Then, as a 17-year-old high school student, she started taking the drug ecstasy, scientifically known as MDMA. MDMA, or ecstasy you see right here, was developed in the early 20th century as a possible appetite suppressant. Of course, today, people use it for its hallucinogenic effects. Users say it can heighten their senses and lower their inhibitions. It seems like the color contrast is... Now 23, Sarah says MDMA helped get her life back. Using the MDMA helped ease my, my sense of fear and defensiveness. They talked about being happy. Psychiatrist Michael Midhofer has never examined Sarah, but believes psychedelics hold tremendous promise. Through a study approved by the Food and Drug Administration, he's been administering MDMA to patients with post-traumatic stress disorder. As a doctor, what made you think that psychedelics could be helpful? Well, 
you know, we know that the treatment of PTSD involves revisiting a trauma in a therapeutic session. So what we, our idea is that MDMA may bring people into kind of an optimal zone of arousal where they can connect with their feelings, but they aren't going to be overwhelmed by fear. For advocates, the key is matching the drug with the problem. Psilocybin found in certain mushrooms might be used to treat anxiety related to terminal illness. The same for LSD. It can vary according to what issues they're working with, how much denial they have, but we would like to have psychiatrists and psychotherapists have access to a whole tool, tool chest of psychedelics that they can use at appropriate time. I have no idea what the fuck that was about, but... but well, you, wouldn't, you had a, what's called a breakthrough experience. You have what all those psychedelic freaks all really want to see. You know, a lot of people will talk awesome. about they like to do mushrooms, but they never really have done mushrooms. <clears throat> you don't really do mushrooms until you see the, what you saw. What you did is have the full-blown experience, and that's one of the reasons why <clears throat> people talk about, like, why do you make such a big deal? They'll say to me, like, why do you make such a big deal about mushrooms? Why do you make a big deal about DMT or the psychedelic experience? Why do, why do you make such a big deal out of it? It's so infantile. Well, I make a big deal about it because, to me, it is a big deal. I, what I've experienced, especially DMT, it's like it's impossible. It is impossible, and it's impossibly beautiful, and it's impossibly wise. And after it's over, I feel like I'm a better person. I feel like I learned something, and I come back better and nicer and improved and more enlightened. I mean, it sounds ridiculous. I'm, I'm agreeing with you. It sounds ridiculous hearing my own voice. But goddamn, that shit is important, you know? And what you did, you know, you didn't know exactly how much to take. And what if there was a shaman? What if there was a center where you could go to? And there's some fucking, you know, place in Malibu, and there's some fucking people that have been doing it forever. And Joey Diaz greets you at the door. Come on in, cocksucker, we got a room for you. He's got his robe on, and he takes you to the place, and everybody does it correctly. You know? What a beautiful world we could live in, man. Well, I'll tell you what, dog. I, I, I started fucking with that shit when I was younger. And I was from the East Coast. There was no fucking mushrooms. But I had these scientist kids that were like 30 when I was like 15, and they, they were scientists at East Stroudsburg. And every week, they were into all this psychedelic and uh, Sid Barrett and all this shit, and they would make stuff. And I got to be honest with you, when I first started fucking around with acid, to me, it was just another way of getting fucked up, killing the pain. Right, right, right. Because I started doing acid before my mom died, and I started tripping. Up. Like, I remember tripping to... Well, what people don't know is you found your mom dead. Well, I was dead. On while acid, you were on acid. And I was on the way down. But <sighs> what's really fucked up wow. was that, that. Wow. That was just amazing. But, you know, I started doing acid for the same reasons everybody else. I didn't even learn about hallucinogenics and the alt button until years later. Like, when I did window pane in the eighth grade, and I went to see... Uh, the stones. I was mind boggled. What I do you mean by the alt button? You know, you made a very, you made one of the best ever uh, uh, correlations. He said that doing DMT is like pressing the alt and delete. Control alt, alt. Control alt delete. And, and oh, okay. Control alt delete. It's and like rebooting. It's like rebooting the your world. Brain. And I remember being a kid and not just doing it to be high. And then after my mother died, and you know the years went by, and even six months, I started selling micro dot acid. And every week I'd pick up a different 500 hits of something, that, uh, four-way acid, I'd pick up. And these guys were great. That's what they did. They tripped they trip the right way. They would, right. they would take sheets for a weekend and go camping. And, they, you know, I would be petrified of staying out in the fucking wilderness <laughs> for three days. That was, they listened to Led Zeppelin. And, I mean, it was crazy. But that Cook wasn't eggs me. on a campfire yeah, and shit. Yeah, they would fucking cook and trip. That wasn't me. Like, they had uh, 100 hits one time. Four of them took in in four days on a camping trip and they had the pictures and it was just great but it wasn't for me i wasn't ready but then after my mom died i'd go into these uh psychosis like i couldn't figure out why an uncle wouldn't talk to me or something and that night on the way home i knew that my uncle and me were always at war when i was a kid. i'm just making an example there was just a problem maybe a girl didn't like me or you know what, what killed my mother i always had a dilemma in my head when you're when you're 16 you always want to know answers and i remember that i would take a hit of acid and go home and, you know, fucking come tripping like by one. I'd be in, in, uh, a junior in high school, a sophomore. But I knew that if I tripped by myself, that's when I got the full effect. And I would go home and take a fucking hit of window pane or four-way acid. And I'd get speakers. And I'd listen to, like, Black Sabbath, Sabotage, or Master Reality, which just blows you out of the fucking water. And, I would, and at the end of the night, whatever problem I had, whatever inner problem I was thinking about that was really eating away at me, It'd be gone or solved.